So now in the previous video, we looked at a broad overview of short distance transport. We're going to continue that discussion on short distance transport by entitling this next flowchart, Short Distance Transport 2. Now there's one sort of problem with short distance transport. It may be okay within, let's say, the LEAF example that we've been doing, but sometimes we actually encounter difficulties with short distance transport, specifically if we're looking at an endodermal region of the plant. So let's look at short distance transport, but more specifically, we're going to subtitle this flowchart across the PM, plasma membrane, of endodermal cells. Now, this is something we alluded to in one of our introductory flowcharts on the root anatomy, um, and now we're going to sort of round out that discussion here. So, in, an across plasma membrane of endodermal cells. First and foremost, what we have to remember is the following. Once water and the nutrients, let's say, that are within it, water plus nutrients, reach the endodermis, we actually have this sort of blockage, this sort of problem I like to think of it as. So endodermis, that's another sort of interior layer, right, endo. We're going to have apoplastic movement, but that apoplastic movement between cell walls and extracellular spaces will be blocked. There's going to be a specific reason why. Apoplastic movement is blocked, put that in big, bold, capital letters, by a Casparian strip. Remember that term that we talked about for the first time, the root anatomy? This is where it comes up one more time. Remember, the Casparian strip has that subernin, fatty, fatty waterproof layer. And so, remember I asked the question, well, wouldn't this seem like a problem, especially if you want to move water around the plant? It is a problem, because now the apoplastic movement that has to happen between the cell walls and extracellular spaces is now blocked because there's this outside structure, outside of the cell walls, like we said, called the Casparian strip that is blocking the movement, blocking our nice apoplastic movement. What are we going to do about this? Well, there's an actually a specific reason, okay? There's a very specific reason we want to do this, and that is that this is the following. It's based off of the idea that the endodermis, this layer of tissue, this layer of cells, is going to be a specific layer that's involved in very, very controlled and regulated entry to the vascular cylinder. Entry to vascular cylinder. Because remember, a plant wants to move things around, but it doesn't want to move, let's say, anything around. It wants to make sure that whatever is moving around that has access to the entire plant, that would be via the steel that runs throughout the plant, throughout the stem, into every single part. It wants to make sure that whatever is trying to get into this can pass, is okay, is safe. And the endodermis is going to be very much involved in making sure that whatever is moving into this very important, highly important vascular cylinder region is okay to go. So, how does it do this? Now, if we look at specifically the movement of H2O, we saw this problem that we alluded to right over here. This was a bit of a problem. The endodermis has an involvement in this movement of H2O for the following reason. First and foremost, what's going to be utilized is something known as osmosis, the movement of water via diffusion. So, this will actually be okay. This will not be a problem because this will be the specific diffusion of free. This is the big word here, free H2O across the membrane. Now, which membrane are we talking about? We're talking about the plasma membrane of endodermal cells. Now, anything that is free H2O would be things, or molecules of H2O, rather, that are not bound to solute or surface. So anything that's not connected to or touching, uh, adhering, better word, to a different surface, any water molecules that are adhering or automatically cannot do osmosis and move through the plasma membrane, or any molecule that has a nitrate ion, let's say, stuck to it, or a different nutrient or mineral or solute, whatever it may be stuck to it, cannot freely move across the plasma membrane of an endodermal cell via osmosis. Anything that's pure H2O can do this because it's a nice, easy way to do that. Now, another way to do this movement of water, if, H, if osmosis can't work, is through the use of aquaporins. Aquaporins are very important transmembrane proteins. And specifically, they're not only just transmembrane proteins, 
but they are a specific type of transmembrane protein. Uh, we can actually refer to them as channels, transmembrane channels. Um, they're still proteins, but the technical term would be a channel. And what does a channel do? It provides an opening. What is that opening for? The transport of H2O. So, remember we have this problem. We're blocked by the Casparian strip. We cannot move through the cell walls anymore, right? We cannot go any further than the cell wall, at least. How do we get across the plasma membrane, then? Well, we can either use osmosis if we're a free H2O molecule, or use aquaporins, which allow us to transport H2O. Now, this is in the case of, let's say, pure H2O. But what if we have those dissolved nutrients? How do we deal with those? We need those because those are nutrients. Those are things the plant absolutely needs to get into the vascular cylinder. And the endodermis is this sort of uh, uh, bouncer that's saying yes or no if you can enter. The endodermis will have a say in also the movement of dissolved nutrient mil mineral ions. Very nice way to say all of this. Dissolve mineral nutrient ions. So that's a nice collective term there. Movement of dissolved mineral nutrient ions across the plasma membrane. Across PM, plasma membrane. So how do we do this? Well first we have to recognize the one following sort of problem. They actually have to move against move against one of the cardinal rules of biology, important rules of biology, and that's a concentration gradient. Move against the concentration gradient. Why is that? Well, this is the following reason. What we're having here is a low soil concentration. It has to move to a high plant cell concentration. Think about it like this. What we have in the plant cell are all these nutrients, right? The plant cell is full of nutrients, it's full of solutes, it's full of dissolved minerals. But the soil also has some dissolved minerals that need to be taken to plant cells. Because plant cells may have some, but not, let's say, necessarily all. And the soil has the extra ones that the plant cell may need. Now, right now, this should look off to you because we're trying to go from low concentration of the soil to a high concentration of the plant. And that is not how it works. That's not how we don't move against concentration gradients unless we utilize something that you should remember from biology one as carrier mediated transport. We need to utilize a carrier. We need to utilize something that will use active transport essentially. That's what we're going to do here. Active transport will allow us to combat this concentration gradient and continue to move things into the plant cell. And in order to do active transport, we absolutely need, don't forget this, energy in the form of ATP in parentheses. And in order to get ATP, we actually have to do something. We can't just you magically have ATP. ATP has to be made, and ATP can only be made if we have the necessary inputs for cell respiration. Remember, cell respiration, a product is ATP. So what do we need to do cell respiration? We need to get into these plant cells that, that want this dissolved mineral nutrients. We need to get to them on sugar and oxygen. We need to get sugar plus O2. Those are the two big inputs of cell respiration to the roots. Why are we talking about the roots? Well, we're talking about endodermal cells, and that was part of our root anatomy. Need to get sugar and oxygen to roots for exactly what we said, cell respiration. And cell respiration will eventually make ATP. Why do we need ATP? Well, that's because of this rule right here. In order to do this active transport, in order to move these dissolved mineral nutrient ions from this area of the endodermal cells across its plasma membrane into the vascular cylinder, we need energy. We can only make energy through cellular respiration. So now, do we have a big problem yet again? How do we do cell respiration in an area of the plant that doesn't really do its own photosynthesis, namely the root, because this area of the plant does not make its own sugar and oxygen. We need some sort of transport. We need something to bring sugar and oxygen to the root. So this problem can only be solved via long distance transport. Why long distance? 
because the leaves do photosynthesis. The leaves make sugar. The leaves have an oxygen byproduct from photosynthesis. So we have to take those leaves, which are all the way at the top of the shoots, and bring their products all the way down to the roots so that the roots can do cell respiration, so that the roots can do active transport to bring these things in. That can be only done if we have long distance transport. Guess what? We're done with short distance. It's time to now look at how long distance transport would happen across a plant.